YouTube or you're watching us via Facebook, I can see your comments. All right. Uh, we don't have to have multimedia coming in and talking to us at the same time. Please forgive me as I'm getting over a little bit of a respiratory thing. So I have a candy in my mouth. Don't usually do that. If you are new with us tonight, we are doing a club webinar number 79. The club webinar is one of the features that we have weekly where we take questions that have come in from different club members. These could be people that were students or are students, active students, and they could be uh, past students, they could be peers, uh, mentors, people just working in the, you know, in the field that have a question that come up. They ask questions, we address them, and if there are some of them that come in that we want to unpack a little bit more than we would do on our forum, then we're going to do them on these club webinars. They get saved, and then if you're a club member, yay to you, because you get to uh, have access to the transcript, the recording. Let me see if I can get this to, to advance to the next one. There we go. And uh, the you get, let me rephrase that, you get the transcript, you get the slide deck, and you can pick up CEUs for what we've talked about. Now, if you're just visiting us and you want the information, that's great. That's free to everybody. And hi, I can uh, see the comments coming in. And it even tells me if it's coming in from Facebook or YouTube. So that's exciting. It's really great. The question that had come in recently was the differences between bacteria and viruses and how we code them differently. There's not a lot of difference in the way that we code them. However, there is a lot of difference in our understanding of them that does actually hinge on the codes that we're going to use. And I would say this is part of the disease process, even though we don't really think of bacteria and viruses maybe themselves as diseases, but we think about what they do to the body is causing diseases and problems with the body. And it and it does make a difference the way we code those. I say this all the time. Some of you guys who are used to listening to me will probably have this memorized, but we code for statistical purposes. It just happens to be a convenient way to get paid. And it's very important that we track the different bacteria and viruses that we're dealing with. Never so more are we seeing that manifestate itself as we are dealing with COVID-19 right now, which is a coronavirus. Now, coronaviruses have been around forever. Uh, some of people I remember were making a big deal about seeing the old Lysol bottles and reading it and it said that it killed the coronavirus. You know, old Lysol bottles, not new ones, like they just come up with the idea that Lysol did. No, Lysol does. And bleach uh, kills it. Peroxide kills the coronavirus. Uh, you know, so this is just something we've always known. But COVID-19 is a new corona virus. And we've done lots of education on that. So if you want more information about the coronavirus itself, as far as the disease process, how to code it, the guidelines that are involved and everything that's, you know, we've been talking about quite a bit, feel free to jump out there and look at the YouTube channel. Of course, more information and discussion is done in the, the CCO club forums as well. But because there is a difference in the coding and we need to capture this for statistics, we have to understand how to code it. And to be able to code it properly, we need to understand what the difference is between a bacteria and a virus. I'm just going to reiterate one quick time that if you need CEUs, the best way to get CEUs is to join our CCO club at cco.u, excuse me, start over. Well, I shall have this piece of candy in my mouth as I'm recovering from this respiratory infection. cco.us forward slash club. 
you get the webinars, you get the transcripts, you get the CEU questions and the slide decks that go along with all of the presentations that we do. We do club presentations like this one, and then we do student presentations as well, which are focused uh, again on purely coding and um, the different credentials that we teach for, not just the standard credentials. So I'm going to look up here real quick. I see some, um, <laughs> oh, that Nancy says that she was, uh, thank you, she was going crazy looking for the email. Again, we did change our format just a little bit. We're trying something new. It's going to be more user friendly on our end and hopefully on your end as well. So as we get started, um, we're going to talk about viruses first and then we're going to talk about bacteria. And I kind of stacked them. Uh, this is actually four pictures of different types of viruses. The first one being HIV uh, infected T cells. Now, there for a while, the virus that everybody talked the most about and was, uh, I would say, scared of was HIV. That really came out in the late 70s and the 80s. Uh, you know, this is when I would have been in high school. Everybody was scared. They didn't know that much about it. Kind of like the scare that we got with COVID-19 because it was new, you know, and, and there was such a, a learning curve. How are, you know, how are we transmitting it? Uh, it uh, you know, are, are, can we, is it airborne uh, versus uh, contact and so on and so forth? And what's the devastating effect of it? Not just short term, but long term as well. So this first in the blue with the yellow and the kind of green, seafoam green color, that's what uh, an HIV infected T cell looks like. The next one is the swine flu. Mm. So the coronavirus kind of looks like this as well. It's a circle and then it's got all those little pegs on it. it. Looks like little suction cup pegs and then they go around and grab onto things. The uh, swine flu looks very much like the coronavirus and uh, you guys have seen lots and lots of pictures of the coronavirus out there. Then uh, the next one is Ebola. Uh, Let's see. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm telling you wrong. So we have HIV T cells. We have MERS virus, the MERS virus. Then we have the swine flu. And then the next one is Ebola. Ebola, you know, they still have cases of Ebola all the time. And uh, it's rather scary. Notice the different shapes that these viruses take. Uh, there is not as many different shapes for viruses as there is for bacteria. And there's a reason for that. As we learn more about the viruses themselves, it's because viruses aren't really living, not like bacteria is. And there is a there's a criteria to something being able to, to be living. Now, I want to also note that I have footnoted all of this in the resources at the end of the slide deck. So if you're in the club, you're going to be able to get the articles and the resources that I use, those links, and then you can go out and do further research for yourself. The A virus, it is, uh, it doesn't usually have its own DNA. It's called RNA that it has. Some have DNA, but that's because they, when um, they're made up of protein shells, but it's not really the same as a bacteria, which is like a living um, organism. There is an acronym that will help you understand if it's a virus or not, because it's not cellular and it's called Gremner. Uh, it has, for it to be alive, for it to be a back, not a virus, but something alive, it has to grow, it has to have respiration, it has to have irritability, meaning you could move it and it gets agitated, it has to have movement, it has to be able to, to get from one place to another, so that means that it has to have little filigree finger appendages or a tail of some type, nutrition, 
and uh, excretion. It has to release something and it has to be able to reproduce. And a virus can't do those things. It cannot reproduce offspring. Okay, it cannot replicate itself. So what it does is it actually attaches itself and messes with cells and then those cells are harmed and then it's replicated that way, but it doesn't reproduce itself. So now that you understand that, think about how when people get a flu vaccine, remember they'll, they'll say, well, um, I always get sick after I get a flu vaccine, and a lot of people do, but most doctors and medical professionals will tell you, no, you're not really getting sick uh, from the virus. The virus is actually dead, and the reason you're getting sick or feeling under the weather is that your body is actually fighting because you're exposing the body to something, the virus, even though it's dead, and then the body amps up and says, hey, there's something here that doesn't belong. And so we're going to produce antibiotics to get rid of it or take care of it. And then when it does that, when you're exposed later to it, it's already, it's already in protection mode, right? So again, yeah, some people usually feel under the weather for a day or two because the body starts making antibodies. It's the same way as if you have an allergic reaction. So you uh, get into something that you're allergic to and your body goes to fight it. And that's what makes you feel really yucky. And, and people that go into anaphylactic uh, shock are people whose body just goes to the extreme to protect itself and it goes too far. And then the, uh, the means end up being worse than the, the reason you were sick to begin with. The treatments for a virus, we need to be able to understand how the treatment for a virus is, tr is different than the treatment for a bacteria. This is going to make a difference in the way we code our understanding of that and why we code the way we do because coding is part of the disease process. We're translating the story out there. And if we understand that when we uh, have a person that has a virus, then we can really only treat the signs or symptoms. However, when a person has a bacteria, we have antibodies that we can use and we can kill the bacteria. With a virus, there's not really a way to kill it because it's not alive. <laughs> So with a virus, there isn't a drug that actually attacks the virus it's itself. However, there are things that you can take that help relieve the signs and symptoms. Malaria. You know that they have medication that they give people that have malaria. But once you get malaria, you can have a flare of malaria at any time in your life on down the road because it's in your body. And your body just um, gets weak or tired or you get stressed or for whatever reason run down and then that virus takes advantage and and does a flare and then you can take medication to help with the signs and symptoms but you never truly get rid of the virus that's in the system the malaria vaccines help prevent certain viruses because it boosts the immune system and protects them to uh, get rid of the virus. So think of putting a wax coat on your car and it's all shiny and it would probably help with scratches and it dusts off nice. You can spray it off and, and it stays nice and clean and shiny just by wiping it off. Versus if you didn't have that wax coating, the, the paint job could look dull and dingy and it would get dirty faster, right? So that's kind of what this uh, immune system does. It's like turtle wax for the body. <laughs> Right, it keeps you healthy and shiny and clean. And uh, whereas if you don't have that protection, it wears on the body. Hmm. All right, that's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head about that. <laughs> bacteria, let's go over bacteria. This is actually this really interesting artwork called the Microbial Rainbow by, and I'll probably say his name wrong, Tal Danine. Danino, but uh, he takes this bacteria and then paints it. 
and kind of brings it to, to life because bacteria is alive. And uh, you'll notice that there's different types that bacteria grow. If you remember in science studying the different shapes of bacteria, I can recognize a lot of them because I enjoyed that part of my science classes. I, I was always a big science nut when it came to that. However, each one of these is an actual bacteria growth, and then he's turned it into a piece of art. And you can go out and look at some other stuff that he's done. But I just thought this was really apropos. Uh, because bacteria is living, it changes, it morphs, it has nuances that viruses can't have. So now that we have antibodies, antibiotics, we can fight bacteria. Whereas before we had that, which really, you know, um, is in our, it came out in my parents' lifetime. In my husband and I, our parents' lifetime was when back, um, antibiotics actually came came out or was that their grandparents I can't remember came out in the, the war like the first world war they didn't have it but the second world war they they didn't really interesting study of history and medicine and uh, actually a lot of advances in medicine happened during wartime because uh, we're forced to treat things that uh, were not in our mindset to take priority before so it's kind of interesting you can study that on your own bacteria is one of those things what does bacteria do? Now, bacteria, viruses, and fungi, we didn't talk about fungi because that's kind of a different topic, uh, but it is kind of lumped up in there. They can all surprisingly cause things that happen to the body that are similar, like pneumonia. Have you heard of somebody that had bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonia? You don't hear about fungal pneumonia, but it's actually a thing. <laughs> you just don't hear about it. It's not as common as bacteria or viral. You can start out with a viral pneumonia and then it turns to a bacterial pneumonia as well. So what happens, and you could get like a fungus in the lung, a fung, uh, fungal pneumonia that ends up becoming a bacteria because bacteria likes to grow warm, moist, dark spaces that are being agitated and when you have pneumonia or respiratory infection what happens you can breed bacteria in those areas pneumonia is something you'll notice when you go to code that uh, pneumonias will be a j code and uh, when you look at those codes it'll state there identified you know code also or and identify the type of bacteria or well, actually, it says organism, if known. Now, an organism would be either a bacteria, virus, or fungi. You know, what's the organism that is causing the pneumonia? The pneumonia is the disease process. It's what's happened to the body. There's fluid buildup on the lungs, thus pneumonia. What caused the pneumonia? Was it a bacteria? Was it a virus? Or was it something fungal that did it? And this... Uh, particular uh, doctor, Sutter, Dr. Sutter Walla from the infectious disease at uh, Cedars Sinai, this was a great statement. And I've already told you a little bit about per, the first part, but it says the symptoms are subtly different depending on the type of microbe causing the condition, meaning bacteria, virus, or fungi, fungus. As physicians, we evaluate to determine the best test and treatments for each infection. Thus, because a virus isn't alive and a virus can't be treated by an antibiotic unless they're using it preventively to make sure that it doesn't turn into a bacteria or, you know, that, that um, it gets worse, uh, but it's preventative, then you're going to treat that type of pneumonia differently than you would if it was a bacterial pneumonia. Okay. Uh, and if it's a bacterial pneumonia, then they're going to give a, maybe at first, a wide spectrum antibiotic, meaning one that's been known to be effective over a large area of different types of bacteria until they can do some type of a study to determine 
what is the bacteria that they're dealing with. Thus, if you've ever gone to the doctor's office with a sore throat and they look in your throat and they say, ooh, you know what, I suspect you've got strep throat. We're going to go ahead and do a rapid stress test, strep test. If it comes back negative, we're still going to send it off. And what they do is they culture it to let it grow because it may not show strep on the rapid test, but in a few days it might. And therefore, they know they gave you the right antibiotic. If it comes back that the bacteria is not streptococcal and that is something else, then they say, you know what, we've decided that the antibiotic, it's not strep at all. It's actually something else. So we want to switch you to a different antibiotic because we know that antibiotic that we gave you is not as effective as this particular antibiotic that kills this bacteria specifically. And they know what bacterias are affected by what specific antibiotics. How do they know that? They know that one, because they do studies, right, the testing, but they also know that it's reiterated by the statistics that we are allowed, we're able to give them through the coding that's done. So when a person has a um, strep throat, they know that Cipro works really, really well for that. So they would say, okay, that's, you, you take Cipro. But um, maybe if you have a UTI, erythromycin and works really, really good for a UTI. But an even better uh, medication for UTIs uh, are um, um, sulfa drugs really good for urinary type of bacteria. I can't take sulfa drugs, so I can't do that when I have a UTI. And I get UTIs all the time with kidney stones. I don't get strep throat, but <laughs> I do have asthma and thus all these allergies and stuff. I'm just finished up today a Z pack and prednisone. And it wasn't because I had a bacteria, because everything was running clear, right? However, I usually, if I don't treat it, I get pneumonia. And that pneumonia ends up becoming bacterial pneumonia. So, again, a bacteria gets in there because of the allergies, the irritants. Uh, sometimes it could be a virus, but the, the course that works really well for me is give me a prednisone, give me an inhaler, and give me an antibiotic, so a Z-Pack, because I'm also allergic to penicillin. And they know all of this because of my history and the coding that's been done, as well as what types of antibiotics work the best for what bacterias due to all the statistics that have been captured through the years for are uh, different bacteria. Now, the COVID-19 is a virus and all the statistics that we're capturing now, we have a code to identify COVID-19 specifically and then that will be tracked with the statistics on what medications are used to help alleviate the signs and symptoms of the virus because there is no cure for COVID. There's no cure for a coronavirus. We have to just treat the signs and symptoms. All right. And yes, you're right, Beth. z -Pak's number one thing for pneumonia. Uh, I think the advantage of the z -Pak with pneumonia is that uh, you, you take two pills the first day and then you only have to take medicine for once a day for five days and we used to call it a super pack when it first came out. I remember, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember, but man, a z -Pak really knocks out pneumonia well. z -Pak works really well because it is an antibiotic, zithromycin, and it works on bacterial pneumonia, but it won't work on viral pneumonia unless they're doing it preventively. And um, again, now I still have lung issues and so on and so forth. I went through my, my medications and things, but we have to remember the disease process, what's going on with a lot of these, especially if it's viral, you have to run through the signs and symptoms. If you've got an allergy that's causing all of this, and it's not COVID, I don't have COVID. I noticed uh, someone said, glad you don't have, Whitney said, glad you don't have COVID. I, I don't have COVID. 
and I was just telling uh, Jesus before we got started that every year in November I lose my voice. Why? Because the allergies hit me. Right. And um, will it turn? Can it turn into bacteria? Absolutely, it can. And when it, by the time it does that, I've had pneumonia a few times, and that makes you even more miserable. But CCO has to put up with me losing my voice and feeling really raunchy in November. <laughs> Usually by December, I'm good. All right, let's move on. Bacteria. Another thing to note about bacteria, before we even get into the coding part, is that bacteria is much more complex. You noticed all the different pictures of the different types of bacteria. Now, if you go to look at the different viruses, remember when I told you that one picture and I said, oh, yes, that looks, uh, that particular virus looks uh, just like uh, COVID and the coronavirus because it's a circle with the little pegs on it. Well, guess what? HIV looks like that too when you look at it under the microscope. Um, the uh, and that was MERS or Mars I can't remember which one all of those look the same they're actually quite pretty there's another artist that does these viruses and bacteria and makes them out of blown glass you know they're little organisms but bacteria is more complex and the reason it is more complex is by what I said before is it's living it does all of those things that we're on that acronym Grimner, right? Besides, it excretes something, it reproduces itself, it feeds, it moves, it, it you know, um, whereas a virus has to grab onto something. Virus, airborne, right? How does, it can't get out there, it doesn't have a tail to wiggle its way where it wants to go. No, you have to breathe on somebody, slobber on somebody, or sexually transmit it. It has to be exposed, whereas bacteria is different. Bacteria can move and grow, and um, so you can have a bacteria on your skin, put it on something, and then you can touch that something, and then it just wiggles its way on into your system. Viruses, not so much. So, like that. So, that's again understanding the disease process. A bacterium is a single cell bacteria and it can live in all kinds of places, but it really likes to live in soil, water, and in our bodies. And we have to have bacteria. Bacteria is a good thing. If you didn't have proper bacteria, your gut wouldn't work. And if you didn't have good bacteria, you wouldn't have a septic tank that had the ability to be uh, uh, cleaned out, right? Have you ever had to put anything in your septic tank? Uh, you just have uh, feces all over the place. Uh, you would, uh, bacteria is what helps break down dead bodies and death. Bacteria is what helps break down in the fall when the leaves hit the ground and they start uh, disintegrating and everything. That's all bacteria doing its job. And it has a positive effect because that allows for like compost for the new growth and nutrition for new plants and organisms that need to, to uh, come out of the soil. Same thing in water and in our bodies. If we didn't have good bacteria on our skin, we would have like scaly skin all over us, like, like elephant uh, type uh, texture of our skin. Again, we have good and bad bacteria all over our body. If you ever want to freak out, Remember several years back, they used to have this uh, show when they would show electron microscope images of things that are living, crawling around on your body. And then they'd show you like mites and, and things, which again, mites are, we have to have mites or we wouldn't be able, that wouldn't eat our dead cells. Now, of course, you can be sensitive to that and everything, but the world would not be a happy place without mites, even though that's quite gross. Uh, also, we want to make sure that we understand again that there's good bacteria and there's bad bacteria and we coexist together. There's a reason for both of those. The harmful bacteria, what it does is it will produce toxins. That's how it builds up and causes problems that uh, a lot of times will damage our immune system. 
uh, viruses will do that too. They damage the immune system like HIV virus is one that attacks the immune system. Okay. So now that we understand a little bit about that, let's talk about the treatment of bacteria. I already told you about the viruses. The uh, bacteria really, the uh, sometimes our body can compensate and take care of bad bacteria on its own. We can run its course. Right? It can happen. However, to uh, sometimes our bodies can't do that. So to help it out, we have antibiotics to help uh, get rid of the bad bacteria. And the way it works is a lot of times it will disrupt something about the bacteria, like not allow it to reproduce, um, knock its little tail off, not allow it to stick to other things, uh, uh, break down the outer shell, the protein shell that it's in. And so there's, uh, again, different ways to fight it. If you had bad bacteria, and it wasn't able to re reproduce itself, that means you wouldn't get worse. You wouldn't get better for a while until it ran its course and what was there died. But at least it's not reproducing itself getting worse and worse and worse, right? So there's different reasons and ways that bacteria uh, is affected by antibiotics and treatment. There is, however, some strains of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. And now we have like super bacteria, super germs that have, it's like they've morphed and learned that you, um, uh, they've gotten bigger and better because remember, they are living organisms and so they adapt, you know. And so what do we do? We come up with different antibiotics like a Z pack that's bigger and better. Now we're going to talk about the coating. Now I apologize for this being so tiny, but if you're in the club, you're going to be able to see this. And this is also in like our find a code. You go to your encoder and um, as we get uh, on the other slides, this will get bigger. Okay. I just want to try to get as much on here as possible. When you are going to code for bacteria, and viruses, these are going to be under the categories of certain infectious and parasitic diseases. So this is much broader than just viruses and uh, bacteria. A00 through B99, This, these are the first things you're going to see in your ICD-10-CM code manual. Okay, the very first things is the organisms that is going to identify what the person has. Uh, most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, especially with bacteria and viruses, these will not be coded first. They, you will be coded, you will be coding why the person was being seen. Well, they got pneumonia. Okay, so you code the pneumonia. Well, then it says identify, you know, code also the organism if you know it. Oh, well, it's bacterial pneumonia. It was uh, staph. Okay, so then you would code that as well. And that's going to come out of the A00 through B99. In there is also funguses, parasites, and much, much more. Okay, however, that little subsection that we're going to talk about, because it's actually not a small subsection, it's quite huge, is viruses and bacteria. And if you look here, we see uh, intestinal infectious diseases. Okay, that could be a lot of different things. Tuberculosis. Uh, but let's go down to uh, let's see viral and prion infections of the central nervous system. So there is um, viruses and infections of one body system. And then we go over here to B00 through B09, viral infections characterized by skin and mucosis membrane lesions. So notice how they're dividing up different you know, viruses and bacteria, but also where they are attacking the body at. Viral hepatitis, uh, let's see, and protozoal diseases, that's different. But notice there is a lot of different options here. So what I did was I picked one, 
of the areas. B5, not, excuse me, I'm, I'm inverting numbers. B95 through B97, bacterial and viral infectious agents. Okay, so out of all of those areas that we could pick something to look at, we're going to look at uh, some viruses and we're going to look at some bacteria and how we code them. And the code range I'm using is B95 through B97. All right, so in that subsection, once you open that up and you're in your encoder or you go to that area in your manual. So now that we've looked at the index, that would have been the index that we looked at. Now we're going to go to the tabular and um, we're going to see the options of B95, which is streptococcus, staphylococcus, and enterococcus as the cause of diseases classified elsewhere. That's one option, all B95 codes. B96, other bacterial agents as the cause of diseases classified area, um, elsewhere. And B97, viral agents as the cause. So we have strep, staph, and enterococcus. We have other bacterial agents, and we have viral agents. All right three options, B95, B96, B97. Now, I was just going off of what I thought were more common ones that you'd be familiar with. Now, let me show you how you can get stumped right here if you don't understand what the difference is between viruses and bacteria and what their names are. If someone says, well, the person has strep, strep throat. Oh, okay, well, that's going to be a B95 organism because it's streptococcus, right? Staph. Staph infections, extremely common, especially to get them uh, at hospital stays when a person uh, uh, post procedural infections, a lot of times staph is in the hospital. But we have uh, strep and staph and enterococcus. We have that stuff all over our body anyway. We have it in our system, but it's kind of a harmonious um, atmosphere there. But every once in a while, we get a little too much and we get strep throat. Or we get a staph infection on our, our leg where we got a scratch or something. Uh, and so then we got bacterial and we got virus. Let's see what I picked. I decided to go with other bacterial agents as the cause of diseases classified elsewhere. Whenever you see the term other in your ICD-10-CM manual, other means that there is an identification for it, but it's not listed here at this time. Okay, other means it isn't a, uh, it doesn't fall under B95 and it doesn't uh, fall under B97, but it is a bacteria. So it's not in any of the other lists that we saw on that previous slide that was very, very tiny. None of those, it doesn't fall into any of those places. So it's not a bacteria that happens with the mucosis membrane like we saw or something that gets into the nervous system things. No, these are unique ones, B96. And I'm not going to read all of these because I just picked out two. Now, you guys may look at this and recognize some of these just by the terms like E. coli, drinking water, People have to have their wells checked for E. coli. If you dig a new well, that's one of the first things you do is to check it for E. coli. And you may routinely check that, especially if you start having everybody in the family having um, uh, uh, gastro problems. Go check the well and make sure it didn't get E. coli in it. Uh, but let's look at another one. Do you guys recognize the B96.1? Uh, it's called Club. Clebacella pneumonia. Um, that is actually a very unique pneumonia and it is associated with HIV. It can turn HIV into AIDS because of the type of uh, opportunistic one that it is. And uh, maybe some of these other ones you recognize words in here that uh, trip your mind. It's like, oh yeah, I think I may have heard of that one before. Now, you're not going to deal with these on a routine basis unless you are working maybe in a family practice and you're dealing with uh, kids, you know, or gastric upset a lot or, uh, you know, yeah, you could, you could <laughs> uh, see these a lot. Pseudomonas, you're going to see. I picked E. coli and pseudomonas because they are ones that 
uh, we see a lot. So let's let's divide those up. The very first one, B96.2 is E. coli. And what E. coli does is it affects the uh, gastric system. It makes you very, very sick. You throw up and you have horrible explosive diarrhea. And where it comes from is from predominantly cows and it's in the soil. So what happens is the cows eat, they poop all over the place. You got wonderful cow patties all over the field. Well, the E. coli is out there. If it gets into your water system or gets into your food, then um, it's not uh, something isn't washed properly, then you're going to get E. coli and then you'll get gastric upset. Uh, most of the time, you can't deal with E. coli on its own. You've got to take something to get rid of it. And there are several different types of E. coli. Notice uh, that it's B96.2, but we have a fifth character of either 0, 1, 2, 3, and 9. The uh, B96.29 is other E. coli as the cause of diseases classified elsewhere, meaning it's E. coli and it's named as a specific type of E. coli, but it doesn't fall in this list that we're looking at. We have unspecified E. coli. We have this uh, Shig Tox E. coli, and then we have other um, Shiga uh, toxin, and I may be pronouncing that incorrectly. I didn't go and specifically uh, S see how to say that, but it's because we don't usually say it. We'll just write S T E C. <laughs> I grabbed uh, and highlighted B96.21, which is the STEC 0157 type of E. coli. And then I went and grabbed the actual. Um, different definitions. So everything that you see in that what looks like a paragraph, that's also the way that that particular E. coli is written at different times. And it means that all of that is uh, included in that type. E. coli is very, very common. This particular type is very common and often comes from cows and not cooking the, the meat or whatever well enough. Note that also tells you to use an additional code to identify if it is resistant to antibiotics. So if the person gets the type of E. coli and it happens to be resistant to the antibiotic, then you're gonna grab a code Z16 out also to include into the coding, right? So what does the person have? They have gastric upset and diarrhea. Why? Because they got B96.21, which is, uh, is STEC E. coli, a specific type of STEC E. coli. And we know that that causes gastric upset because that's what E. coli does. And that we know that it comes from cows and being in, it's just in the ground. It gets on our food, we eat it and it makes us sick. The next one that I picked was Pseudomonas. And Pseudomonas is uh, actually really, really common. Uh, it is a bacteria that is uh, in the environment also. Notice it has that little whippet tail. Man, it gets all over the place. It's in the soil and in our water, but uh, for the most part, uh, I, I hear about the doctor's usually saying, you know, they probably got it from the soil. Pseudomonas. It's, uh, there's all kinds of different types of pseudomonas that you can get. And uh, one of the ways that it affects people is it gets into their bloodstream. It causes pneumonia in the lungs as well. And it's one of those ones that after a person's had surgery, sometimes they can uh, get pseudomonas from that. You'll see this one often coded with post procedural complications or a person that has a, uh, a lung infection, it'll say pseudomonas. So they will have uh, a, an infection, they'll have, uh, it'll be a bacterial and it'll be uh, pneumonia and then B96.5 pseudomonas. And if they've got pseudomonas, you also wanna note that they could have 
and antibiotic resistance with it as well because now that's an option. Whenever you're using an antibiotic to treat, there is a chance that it isn't being affected like it had been in the past. So let's now look at B97, which is viral agents. I picked viral agents as the cause. Now look at these. Have you heard these before? Look, B97.2 coronavirus. How come COVID-19 is not quoted with B97.2? Because it's a coronavirus. The reason is because it caused a pandemic. There's all kinds of coronaviruses out there. There are some coronaviruses that actually have their own term. Now, I did not pick coronavirus because it's so common right now. Everybody's talking about it. So I picked a couple others. But if you get a coronavirus like um, SARS, then or uh, and there's different COVIDs, uh, then you would go into B97.2 and then you'd use other characters to identify the type of coronavirus. However, because COVID-19 caused a pandemic, it's unique and it has a U code. So it would not be coded B97.2. That's all the other types of coronavirus. It would actually be coded with its unique identifier due to the pandemic. Uh, enterovirus, adenovirus, retrovirus, respiratory uh, types, uh, real virus, uh, all, all of these, again, you may recognize some of these terms. If you have a little light study time, I would encourage you, if you don't know what these are, to go do some study. You know, if you don't know what uh, an adenovirus is or a um, uh real virus, go out and look it up because it will make you a better coder. You'll be able to identify faster. You'll recognize, you'll think, oh, wait, there's a specific code for that. Ooh, you know what? Those are B97 codes I have, you know, I suspect. Mage, if you're aware there's a possibility to get to the highest specificity, then that's going to make you a better coder and more accurate, and it will make you faster. So I picked two things for us to look at. The first one was B97.1, which is an enterovirus. Enteroviruses are unique in that they can happen everywhere. They're pretty common, but I pulled a particular article from a pediatric journal about newborn nurseries and it gave this scenario of this enterovirus being in this new uh, born nursery. What they did was they had um, reported an outbreak of this um, echo virus which was a uh, little bit different than, than an enterovirus. Notice the B97.1 is the enterovirus and the echo virus is B97.12 but they actually got both of it. So they uh, reported this outbreak of the Echovirus 11 uh, disease in four infants in the ICU, the NICU. And then uh, each one of those babies were in an enclosed incubator and three patients became ill within 24 hours. The fourth child became ill four days la later. The Echovirus 11 was recovered from two members of the nursery staff and then it suggested that it was uh, happened because of inadequate hand washing as you went from working with one of the babies that was infected and then you went to another baby that was infected. The initial patient was transferred to a nursery because of severe echovirus disease. After the transfer, the uh, the infection occurred in the senior house officers and the uh, psychologist in the unit, and then it just kind of spread really quickly through that. So uh, these viruses really take over quickly. Now, that particular article was on an echovirus, which is B97.12, and the enterovirus is a little bit, um, it, it is a type of uh, it's enterovirus, and the type of enterovirus was an echovirus. That's what I'm trying to, to get out. So B97.1, different enteroviruses. There are four listed here, and the one that this nursery broke out with was the um, echovirus B97.1. 
Now we're going to start wrapping things up a little bit. Here is another virus that you may have heard of because it's considered the HPV virus. This made the news a few years back because they had found a what they were saying was a vaccine for it. And it uh, so unlike it's not a back it, it is a virus. So so uh, just like the flu vaccine they're taking dead, uh, you know, the dead virus, they're giving you an injection of it to help you uh, build up your immune system so that you don't get it. The papilloma virus is a type of wart, but it's communicable in that it's spread through transmission. And you can get it all over your body. You can get it on your hands, your face, your feet, uh, but it's not just your average wart, uh, but it's very commonly a sexually transmitted disease as well. So what you see on this person's hand is the same type of uh, wart that they would get if it was a genital wart, which can cause all kinds of problems and sometimes they're precursors to cancer. So therefore it's very important that uh, it's it's identified. Once you have the papilloma virus in your system, you don't ever get rid of it. That doesn't mean it's going to pop out all over the place and that you'll uh, see it uh, frequently. It's just that it has the ability to come out at any given time. And the only way to get rid of it is literally to dig it out. Right. Uh, but they can come and go. And uh, it's stated here in this article that nearly 80 million Americans are currently infected with HPV and 14 million Americans, including teens, become infected each year. So a wart is a wart is a wart. Is there different types? Absolutely. Papillomavirus is one that, uh, again, they can kill it. Uh, they can get rid of it. But once it's in your system, it's there. And there are different types like I know you've heard of the tree man before that had the uh, it looked like he was growing trees out of his extremities and stuff. That was a type of papilloma virus. And what happens is what's different than what they have versus this normal type is that the body's immune system is fighting itself and it's overwhelmed. And so it uh, doesn't compensate. Normally you get a wart and eventually it either goes away or you can get it treated, uh, but it doesn't usually spread. But if you do get one, it's true that if you touch it and rub it and scratch it, it'll go wherever you, it's a virus, it'll go someplace else. And so that's why people get them very commonly on their hands and feet. Uh, again, B97.7 is the HPV virus. And uh, they, uh, it's very, very, very common. And it's treatable, but it cannot be cured once the person has it. All right. Do we have any questions? Nancy's is my nine-year-old son is watching and he said bacteria is cooler than viruses. And I agree, Nancy. You tell your son that bacteria are much more cool than viruses <laughs> because viruses are just boring. It, well, uh, again, they're not alive. And so um, they can be very, very harmful. But uh, bacteria are just creative. And I encourage you to go look up that artist. Uh, it, there is a another artist that, like I said, did blown glass and did bacteria and viruses. And it's actually quite beautiful. But bacteria are their own little colonies and worlds. So and that's, that's a lot of fun. All right. Uh, so I hope you like this new platform where uh, we can actually pop up the comments that you make. And if you have any questions, let us know. In the meantime, these are the references that I used. Uh, I really like going into the medical articles and journals and finding specific information so that you can see why it's applicable for you to understand both the disease process, what we're coding, why we're coding, right? And I hope you have a better understanding of why it's important to capture specificity for the different types of viruses and bacteria because of the treatments, because of the 
disease process. And we need that for statistical purposes. We need to know that what we're doing is treating. So just an unspecified virus or an unspecified bacteria isn't going to get it for us. We're not going to be able to, to um, show that uh, treatment is working for something specific. If you want more information about the club, it's really easy to find the cco.us forward slash club. So if you have questions, you can ask them there. We answer them in the club. But again, sometimes it needs a little more unpacking like tonight. And we'll do that research and uh, send it out to you so that uh, this format again makes it easier. Uh, some people are visual learners like I am and sometimes having a story or something to relate it to makes it stick in the old crawl a little bit better. There is webinars and cute both for student and club uh, in there, as well as our monthly Q&A webinar which is coming up this Thursday. Got some great topics for that. If you just need coding help, you can get help in the club uh, also. And uh, we have all kinds of certifications that we help you with. Also, all the information that I got tonight was from Find a Code. All of that content, all of the codes, as well as, except for the articles that I pulled, but um, talking about, you know, the, the different type of stack E. coli, that was all in Find a Code. And uh, the, uh, Thursday night, I'm going to talk about uh, a question came in about coding clinic, and I get coding clinic through Find a Code as well. So again, we work with them so much that we've got our own link with them. If you want more information about Find a Code, just go to cco.us forward slash Find a Code and check them out. You know, they have a free format. Uh, it's not as intense as the, all of the stuff they have. And if you've got a lot of money to invest, man, you can get the best encoder system in the world uh, because they also now have partnered with Z Health and some other ones where you can get all the Z Health manuals online, <laughs> which is really cool. Got some education coming through them with Find a Code. Uh, but this link will get you five percent off of any of the find a code products find a code also has our bat technique in it you know our bubble highlight and annotate technique that Lorraine came out in the 90s uh, that is all seen with the CPT codes and again because that's there it makes it a lot easier to do your manuals for testing because you can see examples of how that's done they have other tools like uh, denial issues and they have articles um, they have a uh, scrub uh, claim scrubber and you know th they have an addition for hospitals they have one for profi and doctor's offices it's it's really intense the stuff they have and it's good products um, I've been using find a code since I started with Laureen almost a decade ago and I don't think there's another encoder out there quite as good as it but that's and that's my opinion so again I just encourage you to go look at it see if it's something or if you know somebody that's wanting one give it a try they they focus on education and I think that's why I really like them all right guys we did great we got it on the hour I appreciate you joining us if you're new tonight take some time to go see the cco.us forward slash club if you're one of our frequent flyers and I see lots of names of people that um, um, are out there uh, Nancy that was I'm glad that your son is even watching this that tickles me quite a bit my children get tired of hearing me talk about stuff my uh, my number three had an x-ray on her knee today and she's got arthritis and bone spurs and so we went and looked up I showed her what bone spurs in the knee looked like so uh, again maybe we'll do a video on that in the future so if you know somebody that would benefit from these videos let them know they can reach out to us on Facebook and YouTube as well, but they can always go to the club for more information. All right. And uh, again, we'll see you guys Thursday. Instead of a student webinar, we'll be doing our Q&A monthly public webinar. Great six topics already in the bag for you. All right. Bye, guys. Let us know how you like this format.